Okay, everyone. Um, yes, we're ready to start now. We got the uh, everything worked out. This is um, my presentation called "Exploiting SCADA Systems." And brief background. Uh, well, my name is Jeremy Brown, and I'm a vulnerability research engineer at Tenable. And um, I like to play with SCADA software. So the the uh, presentation is focused on uh, vulnerabilities in SCADA software. So let's get started. So a lot of SCADA software runs on uh, AIX, OS2, uh, Linux, but most of the modern software runs on Windows. Um, so the framework that I'll be demoing later uh, will show exploiting the SCADA software on Windows. So. Um, SCADA software uh, used on workstations. You can use it on remote. There are even mobile apps to control uh, remote aspects of SCADA. And that's what the uh, iPhone app shows. So, attack vectors via software vulnerabilities. Uh, with uh, SCADA software, they're used the same, a lot of, you know, they're uh, in the same programming language as a lot of the other applications, C, C. So, they share, they share the same. Uh, vulnerabilities as any other application. So whether that be client-side attacks from the web browsers, uh, you know, click on a malicious link, anything like that, whether it's not patched, uh, email, or even malicious servers attacking clients, SCADA clients and things like that. Um, also server-side attacks from the internet if the uh, SCADA software is connected to the internet. You know, it's vulnerable, it's just anything else. Uh, or the internal network if it's uh, firewalled or not accessible by the internet. So I'm just going to skip through just some of the brief introduction. Um, click jacking, I thought that would be funny. Like, you never know, maybe it's vulnerable to click jacking. You never know. So what's wrong? What's the problem with uh, SCADA software? Well, security has been implemented as an add-on instead of being built around the product from the ground up, especially for a lot of the uh, older versions of software. Uh, and SCADA plants and things, um, the security is kind of a hindrance. So um, it's not, it wasn't really built, you know, everything back then was kind of built just to be easy for the operators. So security wasn't really a priority until, you know, people figured out people were hacking into uh, SCADA systems. And then systems typically are installed for long term and software upgrades may require new hardware. So when, when SCADA systems are installed, they are put there for maybe, maybe a decade, you know, five years, a decade, you know, two decades, something like that for a long term. So when they put everything together, they're not looking to make upgrades for a long time. So if uh, vulnerabilities come out or patches or new versions, they may require new hardware just to upgrade. And then just kind of thing that I noticed that may be typical for a lot of SCADA systems. Uh, when they go into an audit or something like that, a lot of administrators, administrators are saying, you know, this isn't connected to the internet or, you know, they can't access this from this network uh, because it's separated or on a different network or on a different subnet, something like that. But still, something somewhere is connected to something that may be connected to the internet. Um, you know, the whole process of communication means you can communicate with uh, things anywhere. Uh, you got to be able to communicate it with, in, excuse me, to control it. So unless it's strictly physical access, uh, something's got to be connected to something. And a lot of times, it's also connected to a system that's connected to the internet. So if an attacker gets control of a system that uh, has access to the internet, you know, he got access through the internet and got access to the internal network. So even though the system wasn't connected to the internet, it is now vulnerable to attack from the attacker. So. And then vendors, vendors can take their time with updates and managers can take their time updating. You know, since they're going to be in place for a long term, uh, a lot of the patches and a lot of the upgrades may not occur for a long time. So this, even if you find bugs in SCADA software that is, it could be five, ten years old or even the latest software, uh, you still have a chance to attack something on the network because chances are they haven't upgraded for so long that it's still going to be vulnerable. You know. So. And through my research, 
um, I found that there are a ton of vulnerabilities in SCADA software. Uh, it's just, I don't know if they're not, I guess a lot of the old programming practices uh, have to do with this too. And it's just, they're not, the, the code is not secure. Uh, plainly saying, it's, it's, it's not. Um, they should really do some in-house testing because you could simply, I mean some of the vulnerabilities I've found, I've opened up a hex editor of the uh, file format that happened to be uh, used in the SCADA software, looked at an interesting place and put a bunch of, you know, characters, a long string in there, closed it, you know, saved it, closed it, ran it in the software, crashed. You know, it's, it's just, it's not stable it's in the security aspect. So just kind of who may find the bugs? I mean, you never know who may be looking, but you never know who may come across them by accident or anything else like any other software. So it could be employees, and I just had a couple pictures here. That guy looks kind of curious what he's doing. Um, hackers, the ones up to no good, which according to how you look at it, black hat, white hat, gray hat, whatever. But it's um, kind of the typical evil looking cartoonish evil hacker, I don't know. Kind of looks kind of cool to me, but I don't know. Um, security researchers, security prof professionals, how do you interpret it? Um, we know everyone here has at least six or seven monitors in their workstation, so it's got a clean representation of all of us here. And then, really, I found out you don't even have to have a lot of experience with dealing with security vulnerabilities. You can come over, you know, you find them by accident. A lot of people do. But anyone that cares to look could find vulnerabilities in SCADA software. It's insane. So I guess I kind of moved a little quick here, but um, dealt this to kind of the middle of my presentation. I want to introduce exploitware. Exploitware is, well, I started out, I was finding all these vulnerabilities in SCADA software. And I was like, well, what am I going to do here? Uh, I kind of, you know, I thought about writing Metasploit modules for them, you know, to deal with the exploitation part, which is great. You can interchange payloads. You can, you know, host, you know, you guys are familiar with Metasploit, you know what it can do. Um, but I was like, well, kind of bored, so maybe I want to start a project here. And never really wrote a framework before, not in this sense, not a penetration testing framework. So I was like, well, I had some code I could reuse and start on a new project. And I was like, well, I want to learn some stuff too. So. I just basically in my spare time created Sploitware. And Sploitware is just a framework designed to specifically penetration test SCADA systems, more specifically the, the software side of SCADA systems. And you know, I've, I've used it in, in my, I haven't used it, you know, of course, in any production systems. I've just used it in, in my lab with my test systems. But I found you, you can get reliable exploitation just by, I mean, even reusing um, payloads and things like that. I just, I mean, it was it was pretty easy to design the framework, and I just kind of kind of put some things, I guess, similar to concept of Metasploit or Canvas, but it's focused on SCADA software. And you know, I wouldn't dare say it's anything close to Metasploit or Canvas, but that was my original idea when I wrote it. Something that I could use to check SCADA systems for vulnerabilities. Um, thought it was pretty nice to do. Um, it can check the systems for the potentially vulnerable software. You know, I've written some local checks. Um, it can test remotely, um, you know, if there's any version strings that come up or it can detect uh, the headers uh, in the requests. Um, it can, exploitation is optional but readily available, like I said. It, the, the point of the framework is not just exploitation, that's what kind of the Metasploit was, I mean Metasploit can check with them too, but it's kind of just, uh, you know, if you go into a pen test and say, hey, you know, we got some SCADA systems running here, we've got some software running as well. Uh, on them, of course. What can we, what can we find out that's vulnerable, and what can we see? You know, what can we exploit too? So it has checks. It can. It's also kind of added in an auto pwn feature, which I thought is pretty necessary for any exploitation framework. It's pretty cool to do. You can just hit the dash A, and it'll go through and check for all the uh, vulnerabilities it has in the database. And if it finds any, it'll exploit them. Or, but the payload, it just has one payload right now, which I haven't really done much development on it recently but it just adds like a user, like exploit, password, where, something like that. You can use anything. You might have to adjust the exploit for some of them, but anyways. 
but like I said, the point of it's not for just for exploitation. The point of it is to you know it has local checks, remote checks, uh, and it can uh, just a brief way you can check the SCADA environment for anything that may be vulnerable. But um, the exploits are zero day, and I haven't worked with any of the vendors yet, but I plan to in the future. But for this, um, they're just kind of let you know kind of the, the the post audit. <laughs> You know, the pre audit would be, you know, before they shipped it out. I kind of do like the post audit, you know, like the vulnerability research with them and see, you know, what exactly is vulnerable. And everybody loves zero day. And the methods I use for identifying the vulnerabilities uh, went from manual testing, like I said, you know, some of them actually, when I first started looking at them, I just wanted to look at the file format briefly, you know, through a hex editor or something before I dug into it deeply, deeper. So I just opened a hex editor and I was like, well, I wonder what happened if I. You know, curiosity gets the best of you. What if I happen to enter a long string here or change the, you know, the, um, this value to an FF or, you know, just simple auditing? And I found that after I saved it and ran it with the program, it would crash. I was like, wow. And then, you know, you do crash analysis after that. And some of them are actually vulnerabilities. Some of them are like buffer overflows, like easy, direct EIP override, easy. Uh, you know, some of them were memory corruption, some of them were kind of harder to exploit. Uh, different kinds of memory corruption, maybe pointer corruption or uh, something like that, but it was uh, it was really easy with the manual. That was manual test and fuzzing, of course. In any file format, fuzzer can you know set it up to run the application, log the crashes, things like that. So I didn't actually use much fuzzing for the exploits in in exploitware. Um, it was just too easy. Like I didn't even need to. Like I found you know uh, a number of vulnerabilities just by manual testing, just playing with it. That's how easy it was to exploit. And then some was re reverse engineering. I don't know if you guys seen um, Sakuna kind of dropped my zero day uh, a few months ago. Um, I was reverse engineering uh, the EDS file format. And I just kind of went through a brief example. It actually gave me the error messages. I didn't even have to reverse it. It would actually give me the error messages to properly format the file. And then I went into, you know, after I seen that, I was like, you know, I don't think it's giving me everything, so I wanted to reverse it and see what other options were available. So I went through and done that, and I found a bunch of, you know, same buffer was vulnerable, excuse me, to a bunch of, uh, uh, it was, uh, I think, a Unicode uh, buffer overflow. So I just went through, found it, and then I didn't really post any details yet because I had not contacted the vendor or anything. And I just kind of wanted to do a, an example of, you know, kind of black box testing and then going into reverse engineering. And then somebody, apparently, I guess it was my fault too, uh, they found, they knew what the EDS file format was, they knew what programs used it in SCADA. So they, uh, Sakuna, I guess somebody, caught, they, excuse me, contacted Sakuna and uh, told them about it and they dropped my zero day and stuff. But it happens. Okay, so that was the methods. I mean, it was really I didn't use that much reverse engineering because just because it wasn't necessary. I mean, I mean, I like to reverse engineer just to do research sometimes. But these most of the vulnerabilities came from manual testing, like manually changing variables in the web parameters, or um, t uh, changing file formats, or uh, just you know running, connecting to the server and sending a long string. Like the exploit uh, I'll be demoing today actually. The vulnerability is, uh, I guess, on receive. It just receives. It doesn't even file. It doesn't even format the buffer. It just the vulnerability is in receiving all the data into the input buffer. So I didn't need anything. I basically just connected to the software, or excuse me, server, and sent a long string and crashed. And then I ran it, you know, WinDB or uh, you know, immunity. Some I can't remember what debugger I was using then, but. Uh, and so, you know, I was overriding some other variables too, and I kind of backed off on my payload a little bit, and then I found out I could get, you know, uh, EIP override. It's easy. So, all these bugs were like really not challenging at all to find. Some of them, like the um, the integer bugs, uh, were kind of, I don't know, they were harder to analyze and find, I guess, because you can just, you know, manually send negative one, negative whatever. Uh, or a large value six five five three six or whatever five five six five five three five whatever, and find them, but it's really easy. And the uh, reverse or research and development findings I found, I, I probably went through the process over, I don't know, three or four months just 
on and off, looking at different SCADA software and finding vulnerabilities. And the findings range from, you know, some of them were remote code execution, or I guess if you look at it in file formats, it'll be local. But you know, if you if you, share the, if you share the file or something, it turns into remote, or if you can access it through a web browser, it turns into be remote anyways. Uh, and then to denial of service, you know, there was tons of denial of service bugs, wasn't really that big a deal. Well, I guess it is in the state of software, but as a security researcher, you really don't look at denial of service of being high profile unless it's something that takes down like the entire network, but in a SCADA environment, if you, you know, crash the server, that's sort of a big deal. And then integrity lost, uh, there was some, even uh, some, you know, everybody thinks ActiveX bugs were dead. I even found some ActiveX uh, vulnerabilities uh, related to integrity loss, you know, like overriding files or changing files, deleting files, something like that. So they were interesting, the findings uh, were, but most of them, uh, well, yeah. Half or at least most were uh, led, to, the vulnerabilities led to remote code execution. So it's pretty interesting. And so I've talked through to the demo and I'm going to, I've kind of um, use a lesser version of Splitware. I didn't, I only included like, there was a slew of vulnerabilities but I only included one and kind of like removed some information so because I didn't want anybody to know. So. But, uh, I will demo that now in a virtual machine. If I can, hopefully I won't mess up the screen like we had earlier. Let's see. And the application or the uh, presentation won't crash out of that happening earlier, but so far so good. Um, okay, you guys can see that. Everybody remember right control just in case I forget. Okay, so this is just a uh, Windows XP uh, Service Pack 3 box. And just uh, I think this is pretty much default configuration. Now I know that it may be different in other environments, but this is just the, the excuse me, the default. And it's got all patches, all updates and everything current to maybe a week ago when I I made this virtual machine. Um, so, the spoilware folder, I've kind of dimmed it, kind of dimmed down, it, dumbed it down a little bit, but uh, basically in the folder, let's see, I'll open up the folder and show you guys real quick. All right, so it's just uh, the spoilware program and just the compiled, you know, binary. And then you got pack, the pack folder, which contains all the exploits, in case you want to exploit. So, and there's only one in there. You guys are probably not interested in that anyways, but I'll show you um, the spoilware. You know, it's got the cool little uh, header on it, and then you got dash target for the target. And I'm sure you guys can read, but uh, you know, you can get information about the exploit, run the check, you can run a certain check. And I call them SPIDs, just spoilware IDs, which had a different name before I uh, named it spoilware, but still. Excuse me? Um, I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> what is it? Okay, properties? I'm sorry. I'm, my window skills are not uh, font? Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm getting a lesson here myself. Is that, is that going to be appropriate? So glad to have you guys here. You guys are awesome. Okay. You guys, you see that good? Okay. Thank you. I, I'm just, let's, you guys really want me to change the green on black? At least my presentation is going to go maybe the time slot, so that's cool. We can do this. Um, fuck. Yellow. 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 I click yellow, right? That's not. That's not going to be good. So, I 
I'm gonna go with green. Are you serious? I like the green because it looks cool, but you guys. All right. Yellow, I guess yellow is better on the reading, so. Well, that's. Okay, so. Um, so, I'll just do a couple functions of it. Like, I'll include one exploit. There's many more than that, but uh, I didn't want anybody to steal my O-Day. So, let's do this. Uh, Fraction one. So, it just, it's all kept in a database, and hopefully I NA'd all the stuff I didn't want anybody to know. Yeah, I think so. But, um, it just, I just put it in a flat file database right now, and it just, you know, prints out status, you know, zero day, vendor names. You know, that's not the real vendor name and product title, but I changed that. Uh, and then you got vulnerability description, just like a brief thing with it, and the revision, you know, if, if you, uh, if I added something onto it, you know, point one, you know, all that. Uh, made a universal, I think I used a, uh, a DLL out of, the, out of the binary that it was included, so easy stuff. But, uh, and it's pretty much 100%, I guess I can say 100% reliable, you know, that's something to mess it up, so. And then, let's see. I guess I could just, shit. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> I forgot how to use the up button, so. Um, and then you can just run the check and exploit it. But I've already got the uh, vulnerable daemon running. Daemon, demon, some. And so we're just going to, uh, just going to show the auto pwn feature, which is awesome to me. Like every, I think every exploitation thing or penetration should have auto pwn just for like people. People seem to love that. I don't know. It's odd. It's cool. But uh, yeah, you don't really. Well, I, okay, I'll do the check first because I said it's not really for exploitation, but I mean it is, but it's optional. So I'll do the check first. Shit, I cannot type. Uh, check. So. You can check for a specific one, but I'm just going to check for uh, the first one. So it just goes through, it just runs a simple Windows, checks the registry for it or whatever. Uh, so it's the where demo is installed. Checking it, if it's a remote service, it can check the, um, yeah, it's running on the local host, see if it's accepting connections. I haven't done anything really cool with that, like version checking that much either, but this one really doesn't, this is the one where I just sent like the long character string and it, you know, I got a, I owned it, so it doesn't really have that many information stuff anyways. So my server is listening, so that's that's the check you can go through. And then we can export it. We'll just use auto pun. Local host is, you can do this on any host, but the local host, if you run it as local host, it'll do the local check too. It's got like a little you know if whatever. But uh if you don't it won't execute the local check, so it won't kinda I don't know, that's common sense, but anyways. Uh and hopefully Autopone will work here. So I'll briefly show you the crap. The uh, the payload is it's going to add a user account, and there should be no split account here. Great. So you just see the user and the uh, ASP machine account and the guest. So hopefully that will change very soon. So we're going to autopone, and it just uh, I just it's just. Basically, just runs a Perl script with the exploit, but I kind of I named it dot sp because I thought that was cool, but I don't know if it is. And then uh, payload sent, and where it's an egg hunter, it may take um, a few seconds for it to go, so we'll wait a couple seconds here. But you know, it just sends the payload, and then you got a nice little screen that says. In, in the real thing, it says you know the title, of the uh, vendor, and the product, and everything. But in this, you know, I changed everything, so. And it's been a couple seconds. So let's check. Hopefully, we should see. Okay. And we executed the code on the uh, server. And we have a nice little exploit account with the password where. So, yeah, that's, that's the demo of the zero day I had in the uh, server. Thank you. Yeah. 
should have like done some like dramatic music maybe that would have helped i don't know everybody's like hey, should we clap or should we just i don't know it's zero day but i don't i didn't i don't have it so I don't, okay but uh yeah so you can put whatever payload you have i don't currently support more than one right now which like i said it's just a proof of com proof of concept framework and i really haven't done that much dev on it for um probably two or three months except for getting this presentation ready i had to change all the stuff but yeah, I thought it was pretty cool to have my own framework to do that. So it's rock control, right? So rock control. I don't think I have a rock control on this keyboard. Let's use this. Oh, that'll work. Okay. We'll leave it pwned for now. I'll restore it later. Okay. Everybody leaves after the demo, that's cool. <laughs> All right. So, demo, and I guess I had to put a few recommendations here. Um, vendors. I really think you should try to break it before you ship it because, or it'll get broken after you ship it. It's kind of, I don't know. And uh, for the clients, I mean, I think it would be fair to say to do a security evaluation before you make a purchase because lots of the websites have free trials and demos for the uh, for SCADA software. Be surprised how many you could find out there just by, you know, I guess you could call them and tell them you want to request or something, but I guess you'd probably have to be in a company to do that unless you just wanted to. But uh, a lot of it's just free downloads. A lot of it, some SCADA software is just free. I mean, it's probably not that good, but um, um, yeah, a lot of it's got free trials. Like I'll be showing you in a second. So I just wanted to say SCADA software can be just as vulnerable as your typical download.com application. And everybody knows when you want to own something, you go to download.com, download some mom and pop app and own it, which is if you're bored or if you can own something that's, you know, worth it. But whatever. And I just want to show you like a page uh, off the uh, proficiency. Uh, you can get a free trial of the DVD program. Like this is how, you know, you can get the free evaluations. So you can, you know, check the software out before you buy it, you know, for the clients or check it out and, find bugs in it and do presentations or something like that. Um, so, thank you.